everybody. Thanks for joining us. Sorry, we're a couple minutes late this morning. Wanted to make sure we had a good internet connection. The, the wireless was not working so well. So just ran 100 feet of uh, cable in about three minutes flat. So thanks for the help, Nicole. But uh, say hi to Nicole. She's in the background there. Good morning. She always has the pretty flowers behind her like usual. Mr. Smith is in the house, the Whistling Gardener. Say hi to Steve. He will be answering your questions on chat. Uh, make sure you give him a bad time and ask him some hard ones. Keep him on his toes here today again. So uh, thanks for joining us. You know, it's Connor for Class Day today. I am Trevor, our general manager here at Sunnyside. We're going to talk all things conifers. And when we kind of talk conifers, <clears throat> some folks call them evergreens. We're talking about trees that produce cones. There's an easy definition for you. Um, typically things that have needles on them of all shapes and sizes. I'm hoping everybody got access to the handout way too long as usual that I wrote up, um, but it's got kind of some tips on there for you. Uh, some things that I would consider uh, when you're choosing the right conifer for your own garden and a list of genuses. We're not trying to turn you into to, to Latin lovers today. You don't have to remember all these Latin terms, but uh, it's very easy to find things online if you know the, the genus and the species. So if you go to a great website like a wholesale place that we use, uh, Isley Nursery, I-S-E-L-I, is the, the connoisseur of all things cool when it comes to conifers. So you can go to their website, type in one of those genus names, and look at all of the different uh, cultivars and colors and, and flavors that are available to you as a home gardener through a place like Sunnyside. So, so certainly take advantage of the internet as well. Um, you know, why utilize conifers in the garden? You know, I, I kind of wrote down some notes here in the last few days. Um, you know, my, my main things are structure. You know, we're looking to have something that has presence all through the winter. You know, our perennials go dormant. <clears throat> Shrubs lose their leaves if they're deciduous. You know, what is left for us to enjoy here in Western Washington, but conifers. You know, we have a lot of native ones. We've got a lot of green backdrops but we can find different textures, different colors, blues, yellows, all those wonderful things that will really pop in our gardens all year, but especially over the winter. You know, drought tolerance is a big one. You know, there's quite a few conifers that are extremely drought tolerant, pine, spruce, uh, some of the firs even, you know, with our dry summers, don't need a lot of exterior irrigation. So certainly even dwarf versions of those are the same ways. You know, we, we, can, we can not water them quite as much and have something a little more drought tolerant. And, you know, a big one up here is deer. You know, a lot of these plants are deer proof, you know, when it comes down to it. Not many deer are going to nibble on a lot of the conifers. Certainly some, they, they will eat your arborvitae and some of the thuyas and things. But again, when we talk pines and spruce and, and other ones, uh, not at all. So these are things that we could have some resistance of deer as well. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's a huge amount of conifers out in the world. We're going to do a quick slideshow and speed click on about 45 different plants, I'll show you. It could have been a thousand different plants, to be honest with you, but uh, we'll certainly <clears throat> show you a few of the kind of possibilities, maybe get the juices flowing a little bit, um, if you're interested in maybe adding some conifers to your yard. Um, you know, right now I would just say this, you know, nurseries are having a tough time getting a lot of inventory. Um, yeah, this probably goes back to the pandemic, lack of labor, shipping, on and on. Everybody knows what's going on around the world. Um, so we have a great selection right now. When some of these things are gone, we are out till fall. Some of these things can't be replaced for a, a good period of time. So typically at Sunnyside, we would have a great selection of conifers in the March, April timeframe, a little less available over the summer. And then we would get an influx of fresh inventory in the fall. So mid-September to end of October, we've got a massive amount of, around as well. Okay. Um, you know, one last thing. I'll mention is, you know, growing conifers in containers. Somebody's probably going to ask, you know, can I grow in a pot? What do I do? Yes, you know, we can grow anything in a container. Um, but make sure we use a good acidic uh, type potting mix. We have an acid mix from EB Stone here uh, that would keep them acidic, keep them happy, be well drained, and, and keep them happy for, for a long time. Uh, make sure you choose the right one, you know. <clears throat> Excuse me, a lot of conifers are going to get fairly large. And if we pick the right size, something a little more slower growing, something that's prunable, we're probably going to have a little better luck long-term in a container, okay? So let me share my screen here. We're going to do a little slideshow. So there's me in case you forgot. 
we always say colorful carnivorous creatures. That's one of those tongue twisters you could say three times real fast. But just a you know a couple things to think about. So if I look at foliage color variegation, some people call it. You know, again, the blues, the whites, yellows. There's all kinds of variables when it comes to the world of conifers that we can find something with a lot of yellow, a touch of yellow, new growth that's yellow, fall color that's yellow, or winter color that's yellow. Um, you know, lots of possibilities when it comes to the foliage color. So look at that. Uh, growth habit range is unbelievable. I mean, I can go from tiny little minuscule globe shape, uh, something with some character, weeping, you know, upright narrow if we want something that stays very slender but grows tall, and certainly get some some large ones in too, you know, full-size pyramidal evergreens like we have a lot of native up here in our evergreen state. Um, you know, one thing I would always say with this class and really in life, it's something I live by, you, you pay for what you get. You know, a lot of times we don't charge any more for any other conifer, you know, here at our place. Um, and if you see something that's a little more expensive, it's going to grow a lot slower. You know, and that really what it is, is choosing the difference between something that's manageable, grows slow. Is it dwarf or frankly, is it miniature? You know, that's what a lot of people want. If they think dwarf, they probably want a miniature in the conifer world because it just won't outgrow the garden. Even some dwarf stuff gets pretty big. You know, look at the textures. Like I mentioned earlier, we got a lot of green in our evergreen state. You know, Doug firs, Western red cedars, a lot of native conifers that create the backdrop to a lot of our gardens, whether you're in the town, you know, or out living more towards green belt areas. Um, that's the background. So look at popping colors off of that or getting different textures of green mixed in there too to add some interest. Um, you know, and again, I mentioned winter color a couple times. There's a lot of fun conifers that may look one color in spring, another color in summer. And as we start to get frosty in the fall, may take on a different color. Maybe it's a little more orangey yellow or some purple or some, some bronzing. Uh, we call it chocolate. So it's not a dead brown, but it's kind of a chocolatey color over the winter time. You know, again, just a little more interest to add to the landscape. If we look at really two kinds of conifers that exist in all the world, these are it. You know, and I kind of made a note on there, a world conifer, you know, think of your Christmas tree. What do you bring inside? A noble fir, a Fraser fir, a grand fir, whatever it is, I've got a trunk that grows up and I have rings of branches or whorls of branches that grow concentrically. It's gonna give me a really nice evenly shaped upright specimen. If the other half of them are gonna be random branch conifers. So if you think of your arborvitae hedge, uh, things like juniper, cedars, yews, you know, these are plants that grow a little more random branch and they have a lot more buds on the wood. So I'm able to shear maybe those a little bit easier to control the size. I'm gonna have a little tougher time controlling the size of a world conifer, you know, buying something that's too big for my yard and trying to keep it small. You're gonna lose sometimes with the world conifers. If I continue to, to prune properly, I can maybe keep a random branch one a little bit smaller. Now, one thing I think I added this this year because I wanna make, um, you know, one of my pet peeves is, is bald and burlap or field grown plants. You can see on the left there, a little conifer on a stick that's in a root ball, burlap bag that was dug out of the field. It's a lot of times a, a way for you, you know, as a home gardener to get something a little more established, a little bit older for maybe a little less money. Um, it's a little heavier. But one thing I, I wanted to bring up is we do not take the burlap off the roots before we drop it in the hole. You know, these are living creatures. We don't, I don't pick up my sons and drop them, you know, to, to damage the roots or any part of them. So we want to be gentle. I mean, this isn't something we want to slam around. We don't want to drop it. You want to place a root ball in the pole to proper depth, start to backfill, get it stabilized, then uncut the twine on the trunk, peel it off to the sides. Or a lot of times I'll just take my shears or my pruners and cut the excess burlap off the top. Now I can put some mulch over, finish the planting, and I'm all set. If you pick it up and you drop it in there after the burlap's off and that root ball cracks, we're gonna lose our plant. You know, and this happens quite a bit here. Uh, some customers come back in the summer and say, I lost this. It always goes back to me to maybe being a little more gentle with that root ball, making sure it's got a chance to get started. The hardest thing with conifers, especially uh, field grown ones, it's gonna take about four or five, sometimes six months to let you know I'm done. You know, they kind of hang on for life and you're like, ah, it's not growing this spring. And then May comes around and June comes around. Then we turn brown and it's like, all right, we're done. We got to, we got to replant it. 
So be gentle with the field grown. And the other half of this will be container grown, you know, a lot lighter, maybe a little bit more expensive because a grower has had to grow it in a little pot and then send it to a nursery that you can buy. Um, you know, the vast majority of conifers, especially dwarf and miniature, are going to be grown in pots. But just again, something that's root bound a little bit is not the end of the world. I hear a lot of customers think, oh, I saw surface roots on that. I'm not going to buy it. That's not the point. If I pull out a plant, you can see in that picture that is root bound a little bit. I can take my pruners. I can take my hori hori knife, lightly score it, slightly scrape it. Maybe if it's really root bound on the bottom, maybe I cut that bottom half inch or inch off entirely. I'm not going to rip it apart. I'm not going to dig in and shred it for the same reason as the burlap, but I want to lightly score it or loosen it so that those roots say, hey, I'm no longer going to grow in a little circle. I got some great soil uh, to take off in. So pay attention to growth rates. You know, drainage is a big one up here with the wet winters. Make sure you've got the right plant in the right place. If we've got heavy clay, maybe some water in the winter, it's going to severely limit our plant selection and severely limit our conifer selection. We can't grow uh, some of these in, in wet, heavy soil. So check your drainage. Soil composition is always going to be acidic. We're always going to add some compost, one-third compost to two-thirds of our native uh, soil, dig a nice big hole, and we'll have a happy conifer going forward. You know, look at your tags and pay attention to sun and shade. Just like all plants that I talk about in classes, we're going to struggle with a conifer that needs sun, putting it in shade. It's going to get sparse. It's going to have brown in the middle. It's not going to look as well as you would like it to, and vice versa. We put something that likes a little bit more afternoon shade in the sun. We're going to get a little bit sunburned as we get into the heat of the summer. So pay attention to your sun and shade. You know, fertilizing, you should never have to fertilize, you know, these a whole bunch, but if you if you get them coming out of winter with an acid-loving rhododendron type food or an organic tree shrub fertilizer, nice and easy, a little bit of, a little bit extra green, it will certainly help. Maybe a second dose in that late late May, early June time frame will give us a little summer push of growth. Maybe you want it to grow faster and, and screen a neighbor. Certainly we could we could feed it a little more regularly if you like. But conifer to me is always slow and steady. We want to let those things kind of do do their thing. Uh, slow and steady year after year. You know, one thing I always bring up in this class is what we call flagging. A lot of people come in here over the winter months, this time of year, maybe haven't been out in their yard much here the last couple months and, and see established conifers, evergreens that have a lot of brown down in the center, down the trunk, on the interior of the plant. There's not necessarily something wrong with your tree. I want to make sure that clear because the, the conifer, we go evergreen, but technically conifers will hold all their foliage for three years, then it's gonna shed in the heat of the summer. The drier the summer, the warmer the summer, maybe a little bit more growth shed. So having no growth in the center or having to shake a little bit out every year is something totally natural. You know, perhaps, yes, it could have been a bug in there, something else, but 99% of the time, uh, when I see folks come in a little freaked out about the browning, or the flagging, um, it's always going to be just that natural process of old growth shedding out as the new needles had replaced it that spring. You know, transplanting is the last thing. You know, again, if you're going to transplant something, I'd almost say you're too late here at this point, mid-March, but we're getting close. You know, I want to move a conifer or any plant when it's dormant. I don't want to do it during the growing season, especially with conifer. I'm going to take a huge risk of, of losing it. This doesn't mean taking a plant home and putting it in my yard. It means maybe I've had one for three, four, five years. I don't like it there. I want to put it in a new location. We've got to do that December, January, February. You get into early March. Um, if you haven't done it, do it real quick, like today or tomorrow, and try to get those moved to their new spot. Um, take all the roots you can. You can't bear root conifers. We need to take a nice root ball and get that moved in entirely and not chop too much off. Or again, like I mentioned before, you're going to see about four or five months later, midsummer. I move that thing, it didn't take, you know, it's not gonna let you know right away, okay? So if we look at a few plants, you know, again, we're gonna go fast and furious because we got about a half an hour here and there's a lot of plants to cover. I'm just gonna show you, you know, kind of a few. You know, I mentioned Isley Nursery. Um, a, I think they have the best quality conifers, the best selection, uh, the most interesting things if you like cool plants. 
um, and a great website. You know, we do a fabulous job. Nicole does here, but we have a list on our website. We put pictures of almost all this up, um, but you could also go to a place like Isley as a homeowner. You don't have to log on. There's no pricing. They're not going to tell you about availability, um, but you can see, you know, kind of the plethora of possibilities of all the different things. We might look up a plant like EB's, the true fur here, you know, and see 40 different varieties that we could choose from, depending on how big we want it to get or the color we want. So if we look at some Korean furs, uh, something like Sis is kind of one of our go-to little easy dark green bun-shaped plants. You can see that's not going to get very big. It grows very small. And I like their website and ours and the tags for that reason. You can look right on their garden size. This is not a two year, five year, 10 year thing. This is how big is this gonna get in my yard long term and how fast does it grow is the hugest part to me with conifers. You can see that, that's a great dwarf, just one, two, maybe three inches a year. And I'm never gonna get more than a foot and a half foot tall and a little bit wider, very, very small. We got something like Icebreaker, another Korean fur, you know, that is a good dwarf with a lot of silver in it. So again, you can see the color there. If that color pops to your eye, that may be a great choice for you. Uh, we do have a number of, of icebreakers in, a little bit bigger, no smaller ones quite yet, um, but that's a great variety if you're kind of looking for something with a little silver, almost that flocked Christmas tree look. We look at something like Golden Spreader, that's a Nordman or Caucasian fir. You know, that's one um, that will get you a little yellow all season, almost a little orange yellow. I had this in a past yard uh, myself, and it does get a little bit of a leader down the road, but it's not a huge plant. You know, this is something that's gonna make a nice wide, you know, kind of dome shaped plant to it. If you like yellow, it's got soft texture. It's a beautiful plant. And this is a great example of one, you know, that I think was probably a little better with some afternoon shade. You know, this one, we get a hot summer, hopefully we don't get the 116 degree blast like last June, which never happens, but we get a hot temperatures like that. Some of the yellow conifers might burn just a little bit on the on these soft fur. So this is one where I had it morning sun, a little bit of afternoon shade or dappled shade, and that thing will glow in the garden. I've got one of these out of my sunny bank. This is our noble fur, like our Christmas tree, but you can see how fun and funky that one is, a little bit different. I've got a bright steel blue color, and I've got that prostrate kind of rambling form. Uh, this is one I tucked in a rockery almost 20 years ago at my place, and it's beautiful. It gives me the, the blue spruce kind of look on a ground cover. It's there all year, um, but much softer to touch. So um, that's one, again, just a little bit of height. I think I've taken two little tiny leaders out of mine over the years, and mine's just about exactly that, two feet tall, and it's probably spread out to about five feet wide now, kind of rambling in some of the big rocks out in front of my house. You know, here's a fun one, the, the Japanese fur or the Veitch fur. This is uh, one named in Germany. That's why it's got the Hetergott name on a Japanese fur. It looks a little strange. But again, if you, you look at this fur, I've got kind of all the colors in the rainbow. You know, maybe a little bit bigger, you know, four feet by six. But this is one, if I look at it different angles, I'll see green, I'll see blue, I'll see silver, and I'll see a little bit of yellow. So certainly a, a, a nice variety for some, for some needle color. Now, if we look at another genus, you know, Cephalotaxis is what we call Japanese plum yew. So these are like other yews, but to me, they look a little bit more tropical. They've got a little bit thicker needle, a little bit longer, um, almost look like Podocarpus or something you might see down more on the Southern California, more on the tropical side, uh, but a very cool plant. You know, this is the Fastigia form, which will grow like an upright cigar, you know, nice and narrow, not too wide. Um, it's something I could get some height out of. I like these because they do some sun, some shade, some sun. You know, you could kind of grow these really anywhere, but deep, dark shade. This is one that'll thrive in most spots. Also a great one, you know, kind of for a large pot too. That would be a fun plant. There's the smaller version of that same plant. Uh, this is one we sell quite a few of. It gets, it got a great name, Hedgehog. You know, this is a good space filler little conifer with the tropical needles, but something I'm going to eat up ground side to side and not get in, not get as much height. These are plants I can shear very easily too. So we've had a lot of folks use hedgehog as even a little clipped hedge, you know, or an informal hedge, you know, back in again, sun, 
to part shades ideal. This this would be a pretty useful one to guard. Now, probably one of my uh, problems in plant collecting is Hinoki cypress. I should have probably counted how many different ones are in my yard, but it's way too many. My wife would tell you the same thing. Um, there's quite a few varieties of Hinoki around here, and I could take something like Butterball or Nana that grows like a little rock, you know, all the way up to 20-foot trees that we have in uh, to sell. Hinoki's got a great variation of color, of texture, um, and of growth habit and size. So, I mean, you can kind of pick your poison uh, with, uh, with the Hinoki cypress. Um, these are ones that like hot and dry for the most part. There's very few of these we have to worry about shade on. We want a good sun location that we don't water very much and does not get wet in the winter. You're going to have problems with cypress in general, but these especially if we have too wet and heavy of soil. Um, so make sure you find a good spot. You'll have it forever. These are uh, ones I've had in my yard now for, for 20 years plus. Butterball is a great little miniature yellow one. Uh, grows very small. I mean, you're looking at a little two foot by three foot little butterballs. Perfect name for it with some nice yellow. We've got something like fern leaf. It's got beautiful texture, almost the, the texture of a fern um, that will give me some upright habit. You know, that one's going to be a little larger and bushier, maybe 10 feet by seven feet or so. Um, and certainly one that's worth it for a little bigger specimen spot. We have something like Mauricii. If you like white, you know, hey, sometimes people don't like yellow. I love yellow, but sometimes it looks like it needs food. So I, I like my white. So do Mauricii. You know, that's going to have beautiful white tips, a little white variegation on green. It's a nice lighter colored one. Um, and one, again, that I can prune very easily. Cypress, we can shear if we need to. Uh, but this is another one. It's not going to get very big, you know, maybe four feet uh, tall, three feet wide or so. Uh, one of my favorite newer ones is Melody, again, the yellow lover. Uh, but I think this is the one for a lot of small gardens. You can see the size of this. Um, I might get a little bigger than that, maybe six or eight feet tall, four feet wide, perfect form. And I like this one for that part shade. You know, you've got to, you need some presence in the winter, uh, something that glows with some color all year. That would be a great specimen to th <clears throat> throw in that morning sun garden, somewhere where you get just a little bit of afternoon shade. We've never had them uh, burn here in the summer, but I think the yellow looks a little crisper if you got just a little bit afternoon shade on Melody. Uh, this is another one. If I look at that from two, eight, two, three different angles, I've got yellow, I've got green, and you've got a beautiful blue color uh, kind of coming from the underside as well. So I, I think one of the best ones around. Uh, Nana Lutea is an old fashioned one. We would call golden dwarf in Oki Cypress. Um, you know, that one will get a little size to it, not super huge, uh, maybe a little bigger than four feet long term. But again, something I can prune if I want. And if I want that nice yellow color, that nice upright habit, you can see from the picture, that makes a beautiful specimen. A sunny swirl is kind of a fun one. We're getting more and more of these in. We should call that sunny side swirl, right? No, we can't claim that one. But sunny swirl will give you color and texture. This is an old a sport off an old one, Corraliformis, that I would have some red bark and some really twisty, you know, kind of tips on the branches. That's a really fun plant if you haven't seen that. We've got a number of those in this year. Again, a little bit bigger growing, be a great backdrop, you know, for a garden out in the sunshine, uh, but some really fun texture to that and color. Uh, cumulus is one I have in my rockery. Just a nice little kind of gray, blue, green, you know, if that makes sense. It's not super blue. It's not green. It's kind of all those tweener colors. <clears throat> but it looks like a little cloud. I mean, it's not very fast growing. I got one of mine. Mine's almost 20 years old. And we're talking something maybe foot and a half across and about a foot tall. And I've never touched it with pruning. This is really slow growing. And you can see for the first time that word miniature on there. You know, this is what I think a lot of gardeners look for dwarf. They really want to find a miniature, something that grows even smaller than dwarf. Uh, curly tops, I love blue, so I've got one of these in my sunny garden in front. You know, maybe you know old Boulevard Cypress or some of the old varieties of Saguaro Cypress. This is just a tidier one. It's got twisty blue silver needles. It's soft to the touch. It doesn't open up as much and show all that brown in the middle like maybe some of the old cypresses do. I mean, that looks exactly like the one in my garden. Mine's just a little taller than me, 
after 20 years in the ground. Um, and it's a perfect blue, blue tree for my yard. It shines all through the winter months. Golden pincushion would be another little super drought tolerant, a little miniature one for a small spot in a rockery, a little border plant where you get good sun and you want something very small and manageable. Now, if we look at some cryptomerias, these are Japanese cedars. So these will be a, a little different texture, kind of ropey texture. Uh, really fun, I think, in the garden. If you haven't tried uh, cryptomerias, uh, very different than a lot of the evergreens. They don't look like needles. Like I said, kind of a ropey texture. And there's some really fun varieties of these out. Uh, the snake, the erucaroides. Uh, kind of looks monkey puzzle -ish. It gets wild if you like funky plants that kind of have a character to them. That may be a great tall one for you that does get big. That would be a tree. We have something like Black Dragon. We sell a lot of these a year for somebody that just wants dark, dark green, nice texture, a little bit of a background plant that doesn't overpower the garden. Then we have other dwarf ones. Again, I love yellow. I have this one in my rockery. A golden promise. This is one I can shear if I ever wanted to. It grows pretty slow, but I would have that nice uniform globe shape with something with a lot of yellow in spring and a lot of yellow in fall. This is a little more green over the summer months, but that spring and fall time gets some great color on it. And then if I don't want yellow, I, Trevor, that looks like it needs fertilizer, then we go green and we do something like little champion little diamond, or we have a lot of globosa nana in right now that are all great green dwarf ones that would look, again, globe-shaped and make a really nice specimen in the garden for sun. There's a big old boy. There's the Rens Dense Jade. I think we still have a couple of these left. Now I'm going to get up there in that 25-foot range, and I want a big, tall, stately specimen evergreen. This is one I would get the cryptomeria texture from, but I would also get some winter color. This is one that turns kind of a, a purplish burgundy color like some of the taller cryptomerias do over the winter months. There's the upright yellow, the second suji, same thing, big specimen plant. We've got a lot of these in our neighborhood here uh, by the nursery, and this is another showstopper. If you're looking for a really tall plant. A couple of cypresses like Wilma. You know, this is probably the number one sold container plant, I think, at sunny side and probably for many nurseries. Um, you know, this is the perfect little yellow lime green, soft, smells like lemon pledge. It's got all kinds of good attributes, but it's just gonna grow like a little column. You can clip it if you want. If you're OCD like me and get the scissors out, turn it into a little shape if you like. You know, this is one that makes a great container centerpiece, but also works very well in the garden. You know, I've got two Monterey cypresses either side of my patio, because um, I like the yellow again. And they've got, again, that nice upright habit I can shear them if I want um, and have a little bit of that yellow color all through the season. We look at juniper, you know, juniper is always one of those words like, ew, juniper, why is he talking about junipers? We're not talking about 1975, you know, planting our garage wall with old Tam rat infested junipers. I hope I don't infest and in, offend anybody. We're not talking about old school junipers. It probably got out of hand, uh, a lot of brown in the middle, probably didn't get maintained. But I'll be honest, if you look at juniper, there's probably nothing more drought tolerant than the juniper is. I mean, if I got a bank, I got a roadside planting, I need something. It doesn't have to be those old garbage varieties. It can be some of the really cool new ones. I'd never have to water it. I mean, this is a, a plant that's super drought tolerant once they're established. So don't, you know, don't, don't defend the junipers. There's probably a couple that'll probably catch your eye if you come and look at them. We have stuff like Compressa. The pencil juniper, I want something narrow, upright, little telephone pole. That's got a great structure and a really nice kind of gray, blue, green color again, kind of a nice color for the garden. We've got some great low ones, you know, like all gold. The shore junipers do fabulous here with good drainage. Again, we have to have drainage on junipers, but that'd be a great cover with yellow color, a sweet little plant that I wouldn't have to water. Shore juniper, all gold may be a great choice for you for something low that spreads out and, and eats up some, keeps down some weeds. If we look at larch, you know, we, we, we said conifers at the beginning and a lot of people say conifer, evergreen. It's not always the truth. You know, not all conifers are evergreens. A lot of conifers lose their needles, turn beautiful color in the fall, 
and start over again the next spring. You know, larch is a perfect example. We sell weeping larch. We've got some really cool shrubby larch here. They turn bright orangey gold in the fall, look dead as doornails in the winter. We still got the cool branching and the silhouette to them. They leaf right back out in spring. If you haven't had larch or haven't seen one, I'd invite you to come in the nursery and look at them. I think that's one of the prettiest plants in this March, April time frame. When those little needles are popping out of that bare wood again, I think that's a really pretty plant uh, come springtime every year. Uh, there's an example of a shrubby larch, Volterding, it's always a fun one to say. Um, that's a cool Japanese larch, kind of grows shrubby, you know, almost a little bit, bones eyes itself a little bit if you kind of let it go. Uh, but again, not a huge plant, you know, something four feet tall, maybe a little wider. Um, if I like the yellow fall color, I don't mind it being bare in the wintertime. That's a really pretty plant all year, still the same. Uh, microbiota, uh, we haven't got any of these in quite yet, but this is one we would, we would talk about the chocolate color. If you see the top there, it looks kind of brown. It's not dead brown. It's kind of a different color on the purple side of brown. Uh, but these will turn great color in the wintertime back to green in spring and summer and fall. Um, but Siberian cypress or, or microbiota is pretty indestructible. I mean, I can grow that sun, I grow it shade. You know, again, I think a good choice for kind of a space eater. You're just looking for something green. You can clip it if you want to, but I want something that'll kind of eat up some ground, give me some evergreen texture and kind of turn, turn a cool chocolate color. We don't say brown, cool chocolate color over the winter. A push. There's some spruces here now, the Picea, again, all drought tolerant, great for sun, and these are ones the deer wouldn't touch. But uh, Picea push is probably one of our most popular conifers. we got a bunch in right now. We'll sell out and there won't be any more till fall, but this is a really cute little guy. You can see the two pictures there. This one gets a cone on the tip of the branch, and it has a lot of scarlet red in it. So when this new growth comes out, when the cones are developing here, late April, May into June, you're gonna have green on a little miniature plant with really bright scarlet red tips when those cones turn. That's a really cool plant uh, kind of all year, but, but especially cool in the springtime as well. Again, very small. This is one we got little starts of, a little bit bigger ones. These will grow pretty slow. Um, I even got one up on a stick this year if you like a little, little patio tree push. Uh, Engelman spruce would be native up you know, way colder areas, you know, north, northern Canada, Alberta, um, some of the mountains up there, high Rockies, um, where again, maybe just a different uh, type of blue spruce, you know, something we can get that nice kind of steely blue color with, uh, Engelman spruce, but something a little bit uh, maybe more manageable with some of these cultivars. Uh, Engelman spruce, Jasper is one we have around um, that would just grow just like you see, a nice little easy uh, bond that's super drought tolerant and really super cold tolerant. This is one we go down there in the, the 30 below zero neighborhood for wintertime hardiness. <clears throat> I think for spruce, my own personal taste, you know, I think some of the Serbian varieties are the best around here. You know, sometimes we fight a little bit of bug issues here and there on some of the spruce, to be brutally honest. Um, it's easy to treat if you get them or if you can prevent them. Um, but Serbian spruce is the one that seems to be the most resilient. Uh, we get a few dwarf Serbians in, some other trees. I always put derider uh, as a variety we get in on this show because if I don't want maybe something, you know, perfect Christmas tree shape or a little bun, this is kind of to me the, the alpine Serbian spruce. Going to have a little bit of character, you know, not super big. It's a little more manageable in size, but kind of a fun one to grow. You know, Serbian's always going to be known. If you look at that picture, you'll again see the silver, the blue, and the green kind of mixed together, which I think is a great color. Uh, for our Northwest Gardens. And we got something larger like silver blue. Now I want a big, you know, 25 foot plus specimen, you know, pyramidal evergreen. I'm gonna search out a good uh, upright variety like, like, uh, like silver blue. Some Oriental spruce, you know, this is one, you know, without spending a lot of time, you know, this is a great example of, of how conifers come to be. You know, Isley, um, I know for a, SPAC, uh, a fact, spent over 20 years developing this one plant right here before they were comfortable introducing it out to us, which means the public. So um, oriental spruce is typically a huge plant, um, especially gold ones. This firefly, you can see by the picture, is a great little small garden specimen if you like the yellow 
a nice Christmas tree shape again uh, that won't overpower it. So this is kind of unique in the fact that it shows how long it takes for some of these to, to come to come to the market, so to speak, um, but also something they've bred for kind of modern, modern garden sizes to meet. Some blue spruce, you know, again, you like that steel blue, super cold hardy, drought tolerant, deer proof, you know, all the typical things we find with all the spruce, um, you know, you can't live, you, you can't say no to the blue. You know, a lot of people like that steel blue color. Uh, maybe don't look at Colorado blue spruce seedling that aren't super blue. If you get a named cultivar, you're going to have the best color. You're going to pay a little more. It goes back to that. If you pay for what you get. But if you want blue, blue, blue spruce, you get it, get one of these named cultivars and you'll have exactly what you're looking for without all that green that comes in. We want full sun, good drainage again on these fruits. So procumbens, ground cover. You know, I got a sunny rockery, kind of like I did with my blue noble fur. I want something that kind of sprawls and weeps and crawls all in between a rockery. Procumbens is the one to go. I want a tree, but I don't want 35 foot tree. I've seen Colorado blue spruce monsters before. You know, Sesters is our go-to dwarf one that would give me that Christmas tree shape again. Beautiful color, nice and dense, but only going to get, an, an, again, a manageable garden size. We can do weepers. You know, anything weeping, it is up to you and your taste what you want to do with it. Do I want to stake the leader up and have something that falls down and is a little more narrow? Do I want to let it crook over and make something that's more bushy with character? It's all up to you. You can see on there. Garden size varies with culture. You're going to see the exact same thing on weeping plants here at Sunnyside. It doesn't really have a height or a spread because you could do what you want with a lot of these weeping type conifers. We look at some pines, you know, the holy grail to the conifer lovers, the chief, the chief Joseph. We still have a few. These will be gone here and we won't see any till next winter again. But this is a great lodgepole pine. It's all about winter color. This thing looks green as green can be, spring, summer, fall. We start to get cold lights and that thing glows with that kind of yellow, leaving a little touch of orangey color on a cold winter all through the winter months. So you want something that's gonna glow and pop in the landscape. Chief Joseph is a pretty cool plant. You know, that's not a super huge pine, but that's got some sweet color to it. Not to disrespect the Mugo, but we call this the the poor man's chief around here. Maybe the chief gets a little expensive sometimes. The mugo is going to be much less. And this is, again, same idea. We've still got some great uh, golden mugo pines around here that are green during the growing season. But when we get those cold temperatures in the winter, uh, something that's going to absolutely glow with that yellow all through the season. You know, pines, again, drought tolerant, deer proof. You can plant these out in hot, sunny spots, really easy to grow. And this one, we can clip the candles a little bit if we want to keep uh, some of the size down as well. Uh, something upright and narrow, we always carry Comet around here. That's a little darker green, little longer needle type Austrian pine. You know, again, I want that exclamation point. I want a big old, you know, upright specimen that's not going to overpower my garden and take up a huge footprint. This would be a great one for sun and for dry that would give me a little bit of height and some presence without eating up my yard. We look at some Japanese pines. You know, these are some ones um, that we absolutely want to have perfect drainage. Do not grow anything pinus parviflora if you are worried at all about clay, wet winter. These are probably the poster child for getting too wet and rotting out. I hate to admit it, but Typically in the course of the spring and summer here at the nursery, our staff will typically overwater a couple of these in the pots even here, and we will, we will have some of these crash. So we don't want to water these much. We want them high and dry. But some really fun plants. Goldilocks will give me some cool character and some yellow. <laughs> You'll see blue ones around. We've got white-tipped ones. We've got quite a few uh, different part of floors. Mini Twist will be an eastern white pine, Pinus strobus. And again, so eastern white pine is a monster plant. You know, we don't we see them around. You got a big yard, great. It's a it's a magnificent specimen tree, but we tend to carry just mini twists because it's a nice, tidy, more shrubbier grower. It's got the twisted needles, the silvery green color you want, but it's not going to again overpower the garden and turn into too big of a plant. 
If we do the same thing on weeping, it's Niagara Falls. We don't have to have old weeping Eastern white pine that ate up half our yard. This is something I keep low and I can let flow and do a nice garden setting and sun and not have to worry about it taking over my half my landscape down the road. And sea urchin would be the small bushy form. I don't want twisted needles. I don't want any weeping. I just want a nice stout, you know, little bun shaped plant with that silvery green color. Sea urchin might be a great one that stays a little, little smaller. That's a miniature one. A uh, black pine is always gonna give me the, again, the dark needles, Japanese black pine with those long white candles. Thunderhead is the one we typically have around and it still gets pretty big, you know, 15 or so by 12 across, kind of that broad dome-shaped evergreen. It's a great background plant, um, but that's one, again, I can clip the candles. This is one you'll see sculpted a lot, black pine. Even if I have a big variety, if I clip candles, I can cloud prune them and turn them into a, an excellent showpiece. <coughs> Excuse me, some of the podocarpus, I've seen these called too many names. Uh, Mountain Torterra, there's all kinds of names, Alpine Podocarpus. These are hardy ones. Um, again, I would put at the top of the drought tolerant for conifers. These are up there to me with juniper and some other ones that we really just don't have to water much once they get going. Um, I think there's some fun little dwarf cultivars. We carry blue gem, would give us some blue color. We do some red tip, uh, which has got some red on it. Um, and we've got even a new one called Jalaco Red. It's even a kind of a purplish color right now in the winter. It's very cool. Back to green, here comes spring. Um, Cyanopodus is Japanese umbrella pine. This is another fun one. We kind of go back to that Japanese yew we talked about at the beginning. This one looks a little more tropical to me. Uh, it's a great tree, a conversation piece. A lot of people that come to the nursery stop and look at that. Is that what I think it is? That's not a pine, it's softer. It's a very different evergreen. Um, the cool thing that I like about these these days are the new cultivars. You know, there's not, we're not stuck with the old species uh, Japanese umbrella pine that would get super huge. We've got nice, tall, narrow ones, and we've got a lot of great dwarf ones around right now. So ones like <coughs> a Grün Krugel, if you speak German, we call it green bullet here in the, in the States because it's, again, it's got that perfect little small dome texture. That's not a huge plant. Uh, for the home garden. We've got ones like Joe Cozy, and, and now this year, a brand new one called Tip Jole that's from the Netherlands um, that's a little sturdier as well. But again, I want something with a big needle that grows a little more concentric and upright without eating up my yard. If we look at a couple U's, um, you know, mainly for us, we carry some, some different spreading type U's that are lower. Um, and then we get a lot of upright ones. If you're looking for that narrow focal point or even to build a hedge as kind of an arborvitae substitute, we get a lot of English or Irish use in here. Um, silver spire, uh, we've got green ones. We've got, uh, we've got quite a few new varieties too. And again, the best thing with you is you can prune it. You know, this is a random brass conifer that I can clip or top if I want to and keep it in some sort of shape or again, from getting, getting out, of, out of size in the garden. So silver spire is one. I would have some yellow with a little silvery color. You know, that again, upright and narrow, like a little telephone pole. If we go to kind of bushy ones, we would have something like dwarf bright gold around. I want a mass of yellow that I can clip if I want. Um, that will get wide if I don't prune it. But again, we can prune use. Um, this is one I would get a really a big dose of yellow. I have this in my front yard. And sometimes I would joke, you might have to put some sunglasses on to go, whoa, that is really yellow uh, when it flushes out some growth. Then we go small, you know, maybe you just want something just a couple feet tall that I could clip that maybe spreads a little bit more. Uh, we go through quite a bit of these uh, golden dwarf Japanese use. These are ones that look extremely yellow here in about a month when the new needles come out. Not so yellow the rest of the year. So if you like a little spring color, and then again, more green during the remainder of the season, uh, the, the Nana Arescens or Golden Dwarf one might be a great choice for you. A couple Arborvitae. Uh, this is one I have in my yard again. You know, Arborvitae doesn't always have to be our little green soldiers that, that make a fence around our property. Um, this is Golden Tuffet, which would have a nice kind of limey green. You know, you can see the color there in that. Maybe a little more orangey color in the winter is what I like. Um, again, not very tall, 
kind of spreads into a little low mat. Uh, mine's very old, probably four feet across and maybe just a foot tall. I mean, it's a small little plant, again, that I've never had to prune or do really do much work on. If we want to go again, something besides green, you know, look at Jantar. That's a great variety of arborvitae. If this was around, you know, 20 years ago when I planted my arborvitae hedge to hide my neighbor, I might have popped yellow in there or maybe alternated or mixed it up a little bit because I think that's a great little uniform, uh, dense plant. Again, if you like the yellow, that, that would pop in the landscape. And we have some funky ones like Frankie Boy, you know, kind of thready texture that kind of looks like almost if you had hair, kind of, or if I had hair, kind of a bad haircut, kind of flops out and does all kinds of fun things. Um, that would have some yellow on it too. And this to me is a great plant for the, the ones that maybe some people struggle with. If I've got wet, I've got heavier clay, I maybe have struggled with the spruce and the pines and some other things that maybe like it a little higher and drier. This might be a great choice for a lot of homeowners up here. It's a dwarf Western red cedar. We sell quite a bit of these these days. We've got them in a few different sizes around right now. This is one that looks just like Western red cedar. I've got the same fragrance. I've got that bronzing, that really pretty color in the winter time. But you can see from that, now I've got a shrub, you know, something that won't grow on a tree. It's not gonna send up a leader that I can eat up some space and have a really pretty specimen um, and not turn into a tree down the road. We've got just a few hemlocks here. Um, Cole's prostrate. Um, we have one of these, uh, Steve planted years ago in our garden, you come look at. I've got one of these in my garden in deep, dark shade. You know, I like hemlock because this might be a great choice for folks that have more of that morning sun to shady location. We can grow hemlocks um, in a little bit more shade. And the ewes I mentioned earlier as well, that's another great shady one. Um, the hemlocks, we can find some fun plants. You know, Coles is one, again, weeping low with some character to it. Uh, mine, honestly, almost looks like a hemlock ground cover. I have it underneath an old deciduous azalea kind of down with some black mondo grass. Looks great all year. Doesn't overpower my garden, but it doesn't give, gives me the spread, but not the height. And we've got great colored ones like Moonfrost. You know, this is one even looks a little pink in the winter months, but I've got all kinds of green with that beautiful bright white frosting on it. Uh, that's a shrubby grower. Again, not something that's gonna get a leader and turn into a tree, but something I'm gonna have that really nice dense globe shape with. Um, if I like that white color really brightens up uh, some of those shady areas. And if I want something a little bigger, uh, we always have some summer snow around. So that's another one. I will get a leader, not a huge tree, maybe 10 feet tall, but I'm going to have that green dense look with, again, that beautiful frosting of white on it uh, to enjoy during the course of the season. Well, that's power slides right there, Nicole. We somehow made it in a respectable amount of time. But you can see, I wrote a little smiley face on there. You know, we live in the evergreen state, so don't forget to rediscover your evergreen state here in Washington. Um, but that's our web address there. Um, you know, just a reminder, the classes are recorded. We went fast and furious through some slides. I kind of threw some names out there, Isley Nursery website. You can always go back um, and watch a little bit of this again if you're not tired of listening to me. Um, check some pictures out. I bet you hopefully everyone was frantically writing down some names of ones that caught their eye on their list there as we were going through. But you can always email us. I'm at the nursery. Uh, it's springtime here, so I'm here pretty much every day, but Wednesday, um, I'm here all weekend if you wanna come down to chat. We got a great selection right now, like I mentioned, not so much here in a month or two. I think there's gonna be some things we're gonna run out of and we will have to wait to replace till fall, okay? So I'm gonna stop sharing here, hold on. We'll go back, so just real quick, um, you know, with all the classes we do here, I think it's awesome. We help out our local customers. You come down here and do some shopping, all conifers are 20% off. So you start today, you got till next Friday to do some shopping. You tell the, the cashier you were at Trevor's conifer class, boom, they hit a magic button. You got 20% off your, your conifers this week. So uh, with these, we got big ones, we got little ones. You know, some aren't super cheap because they grow slow. Uh, just remember, you pay for what you get for, and the 20% off is a really nice savings uh, for a lot of the customers. We've had a, no, a number of people down today. 
I bet trying to grab them here. The weather's not too bad. We're not, we're not looking like we're going to rain so much. So um, just a reminder, tomorrow um, you're stuck back watching me here at 11 o'clock on Sunday. Uh, it's the new for 22 class. That's got a great ring to it. I think I wish we every year. New for 22. I could just keep saying that. So I'll have a slideshow going. Uh, there will be a list out. I haven't put it up yet. I'm still working on it. That's a lot of plants. But it will be there before the class, I promise you. We'll have a list of all the trees, shrubs, roses, perennials, even a few store things um, that are new here at Sunnyside and new to the market uh, for 2022. Uh, way too many hydrangeas, I can tell you already, if you like hydrangeas, but the list will be up here quick. Uh, hopefully you can join us for that uh, tomorrow. Uh, next week is a great spring class. Um, we'll have the Everett Clinic back sponsoring our March class. It's spring veggie time. We're warm enough now, we can start throwing out spring veggies. Uh, we've got some great staff here uh, to talk vegetables with you. Holly, our uh, seasonal department manager, is the top of the list when it comes to vegetable knowledge. So I bequeath unto her the vegetable class, and she will be teaching it with Sarah, uh, her cohort, next Saturday. Um, join them. They're really fun to listen to. They're going to drop all kinds of vegetable knowledge on you. She's been doing this a long time. She might even have a little more gray than me. Don't tell her I told, told you that. But but uh, she's been doing this a long time. So jump in and listen to Holly and Sarah next Saturday at 10 o'clock, spring vegetable time. All right? So I've been talking to mile a minute here, Nicole. Let's see if we, do we have any questions left? Oh, I'm telling Holly what you said. Uh, she's kidding. here today, so she'll probably watch my <laughs> class tonight and she'll give me a hard time when I see you next week. <laughs> so between all this information, the beautiful weather we're having, max selection discount, like I feel like I'm going to go shopping after we're done. So I got one for you too, Nicole. We can find and you one. I know, and no thanks to my wallet, but just kidding. Um, so we've been a little quiet, but I have a ton of questions, and there's some that are popping through. So we've got some great things. So there's so many conifers, and there's so many different varieties. Like, where do you, I mean, where do you even start? Do you start by like size or color? Where I mean, where do you start? Well, again, for me, um, I would always start with location. You know, it's to me the first decision is sunshade. Second decision is do I have good drainage or not. And then we look at size. And, and again, the conifer class probably speaks it more than any other one, this word dwarf. You know, and if we were doing this live, everybody that was here in the class would go, I'll be like, picture in your mind what the dwarf conifer is. Close your eyes. And everyone would go, ooh, this little round, you know, two foot by three foot little beauty that I never have to touch again. So just that is miniature, not dwarf in a lot of the conifer world. And that's what I want to make sure people understand. Look at that growth rate. Look at the garden size because a lot of dwarf this and dwarf that, I still have something 12 feet. And, you know, we, we spent a little time talking about types and pruning. You know, we do that pruning coming out of winter. If I don't, if I can't prune my conifer, or I don't keep up on it, I'm going to lose long term. This is not as easy as a shrub. I want to prune it a little bit every year if I can and not wait five years. I can't cut back a conifer very far. So look at your size you have. You may like something, come to me, come to the staff and say, I like that plant. It's a little too big for me. What are the choices I have for something a little bit smaller or different shape? And we can figure something out or help, help you get something that's perfect for you. Okay. So from somebody who's just starting out, a new homeowner, redoing the lawn, like, why yeah. do I want a conifer? Why do I want a plant? I mean, yeah, they're cool. Why, I'm, you know, yeah. why do I want a plant? <laughs> Well, for me, again, it's, it's kind of what I mentioned at the beginning. You know, we have a lot of green around here. Everybody, I don't think there's one yard I can look at anywhere around here doesn't have conifers in it because we have native conifers all over. But my thing is perennials go dormant, die to the ground. Shrubs lose their leaves. We enjoy the fall color. What's left in the garden? I don't think anybody who likes a year-round garden wants nothing in their garden except for the green backdrop that's left for Mother Nature kind of thing. So it's not that... You know, for me, I have way too many probably because I love them all over the place. It's not that the whole garden has to be nothing but conifers. It could be, but it's picking those spots. I'd like some yellow here. I'd like a little blue here. I like a different green texture here because whether it's spring, summer, fall, winter, every week of the year, that thing's going to shine. You know, maybe you don't even see it as much during the growing season, but then that perennial dies down. Whoa, I forgot I got that beautiful blue thing waiting there that I can enjoy all through the winter months. 
Okay. All right. You make a valid point. I'm trying. I'll try to talk to you. <laughs> I know. So, so what do you plant around them? I mean, what do you have yeah. around um, your conifers and your yard to kind of help support and yep. not make it crazy, but make it all kind of a cohesive, yep. nice thing? Oh, oh, I think there's a lot of good companion plants for conifers. Again, we, we want to have stuff like with like. So depending on your garden, where your location will we'll dictate the plants. But I'm always looking at things like small grasses that love sun a zillion small perennials. I got cone flowers, black-eyed Susan, sneeze weed, I and mean, we go on and on that are flanking these conifers in my sunny gardens. Again, that grow up every year, bloom all summer, but when they're gone, sweet, I still got that conifer to look at kind of in the background. So it's not, you know, yeah, part of it's winter, but it's also what pops the color, you know, and if you have that green backdrop with that orange flower, you know, hanging out in front of it, it's really going to shine as it blooms all through the summer. I'd look at heathers, you know, that's a really easy one to throw some heathers in. Same soil requirements, love acidity, low maintenance. Now I can get color in winter heats all through the winter and spring or plant some scotch heathers that I can again have more foliage color and have some summer bloom as well. So there's a lot, lot of companion plants. If we stick with that again, sun or shade, you know, I mentioned my shady ones, my hemlocks, you know, black mondo grass, epimediums, hellebores, you know, a lot of these good sturdy, I gotta like to water a lot at my house. So a lot of those drought tolerant shady things, that's exactly what's around my different hemlocks in my shade garden as well. So speaking of drought tolerant, because we mentioned this all the time, when established. So how do yeah. you know, I mean, how much do you water until they get established? How do you know when they are? How much yeah. do you do after watering questions? Well, well, and that's always a tough one because, again, it depends on probably how well your soil drains. Um, if you're worried about it, I'd always get a finger there down just outside the root ball. Maybe I mulch and it looks dry, but if I'm dry, you know, down a couple inches in the soil, yes, I'll give them some water. But this is probably different than other classes I would teach other plants. You know, I would never be out there soaking a newly planted conifer on a daily basis ever. You know, I'm looking at you know, say I take home a little plant of you to grow this year, I'm probably going to check it twice a week this summer at the most and water it heavy when I water it, but allow it to dry out a little bit in between, if that makes sense. I'm not going to go out there and soak it day after day after day. Now we might have issues with, again, the overwatering side, even though we might have good drainage. You know, I, again, it, shut the water off when. That's a really tough one, depending on knowing your soil. You know, typically up here, on the sandy side, it's gonna root pretty quickly. You know, it doesn't need a lot of water anyway. You know, probably three, four years go by, you're not gonna be watering much at all. Um, you know, very infrequent, we should say. You know, maybe you've got, you know, a little smaller plant, maybe it's in a pot, you know, for say, yeah, I'm gonna check them a little bit more often in that case. But, you know, how's that a roundabout way of, I don't know, Nicole, maybe you check it like twice a week here for a summer or two. You know, then down the road, it's much less. I mean, I haven't watered. I mentioned a zillion things in my that I had in my garden as we went through these slides. None of that stuff got watered at all last summer, except, you know, maybe twice a month, you know, when I was just soaking my front bank down to keep everything happy. And that's probably not so much even about the conifers. It's about the other plants that were planted in between them too, so. Gotcha. Yes, vague, but also specific all at the same yeah. time. So that's, there you go. <laughs> that's helpful. Vague, vague spiffic, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> so what about fertilizer? How often do we do yeah. that? How do we know? Yeah, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the fertilizer, you know, and again, I conifers love acidity. You know, rhododendron food's an easy choice. You're never going to hurt your any conifer by putting rhododendron food on it. We carry a tree shrub food here that works great for conifers and maples are kind of the two things I use it for. Um, it doesn't have the acidity, but we have acidic soil. You know, it's not gonna matter. I'd be shocked if anybody anywhere near here didn't have slightly acidic soil at least, if not more acidic than that. The most I, you know, for me, you know, if they're happy, I shouldn't say this, I'm probably not fertilizing my conifers a whole lot. If they look great, they've been happy, they don't need food. You know, if you mulch, you got good soil, you probably don't need to. At the most I would ever do is go out this time of year and do it in spring and a second dose, maybe again, like that May, late May, early June time, if I want a summer flush. Maybe I want it to grow faster and block my neighbor's garbage can or something. Yeah, you could feed it a little bit more, but it's just those two times, 
if you really wanted to get it on steroids like a grower, maybe you do it once more in like early August and that's it. We would never feed in the fall or the winter. Okay, good tips. And it's good to know. I mean, it's realistic. Well, there's, you know, ideally you do this. I mean, life happens, right? So it's good yeah. to know, you know, as long yeah. as they're happy, yeah. they're happy. It's good. Yeah, I mean, if it looks good, it's got good color. And it's, it's had, you know, there's nothing that says, I got to go feed you every single year. You know, they're, if you've got great soil, they're going to grow great on their own. Good. Love that. Um, so we talked about the flagging, about the inside needles yep. falling. So do you need yep. to worry about raking those up? Can you just let them be on the ground? What do you do? <laughs> Well, I'll laugh, Mr. OCD here. Yes, I put my gloves on in the fall and I usually reach in there real carefully and knock most of it out and then pick it up. But that's OCD me. Um, you don't have to. Um, most of it you can never see. Some plants, you might maybe you see, and that's kind of what goes back to me to the sunshade thing. If I put one in too much shade and I get flagging, you're probably not going to be happy with the way your conifer looks because you're really going to see the brown because it's a little bit sparser and a little bit looser growth. If it's packed in sun and growing properly and maybe you, you shear it on occasion to keep it dense, you're probably never going to see any of that. You never have to clean it out anyway. But but yeah, some of the more, a lot of my Hinoki's in particular, it's not like I walk by and see brown, but I'll dig in there. I know you're in there somewhere and I'll just knock a little bit out and scrape it up and be done. You don't have to. They'll fall out eventually with the wind, the rain, and then it turns to mulch at the base. So for the rest of us who are not OCD, it's <laughs> you don't you don't have to. Yeah, yeah. If you got you know if you've had a pine if you've had a pine tree for twenty years and you got ten inches of pine straw mulch covering your bed, you might want to rake some of that up on occasion. But besides that, you'd be all right. Good. Um, so in other worlds of plants, we talk about the botanical name versus common, how sometimes, you know, common names can yep. be the same for a lot of different plants. But with yep. conifers, what do we need to know when we go looking for things? Do we need to know the exact Latin? I mean, can we get away with the common? What do we need to know? It, that's a tough one. You can almost do both. I mean, I'll just say this. You know, Latin never lies. I mean, there's a reason we use Latin for nomenclature and classification because I can call this specific plant and I know exactly what it is. Do you got to go learn Latin botanical names? No, I mean, I'm not going to tell you that, but I try to do that list this way because if you see just the genus, you know, Picea for spruce and Pinus for pines, you know, Podocarpus and Taxus for use, I mean, on and on, that's a great way to search for stuff, you know, whether you come to a nursery or you go online and you want to see kind of what's out there, that's a place to start to me. I Yes, I could type in English U and a whole bunch would come up and I could do the same kind of thing. But Latin never lies. I mean, I'm again, I'm not expecting anybody to memorize all the genuses of, of conifers, but I put that almost on there as a fail safe. If you're not, that's not what I'm looking for. Type in the Latin name and eventually you will get there because that will really narrow down those search engines as you're searching. Makes sense. Um, and, you know, printing off the list or making notes is always helpful because it's hard to remember yeah. those things for those yeah. of us that are not playing. But, you know, and again, it's not, it's not as much with conifers, but it drives me crazy. There's a lot of shrubs, perennials on and on that have the same common name. And that's where, you know, okay, you, you came in here and asked for Andromeda or Lily of the Valley. You know, I could go on and on. It's like, all right, are we looking for Pieris the shrub or are we looking for the bulb, the ground cover? Or do we, you know, there's just so many plants that are available to us gardeners. Again, the Latin never lies, but the common name will get you quite a ways. I mean, that'll get you narrowed down to, to very few. Gotcha. So there's been a lot of questions coming through about specific conditions. Like, yep. you know, I have a shady side of my house that I need something, you know, how do we yep. go about that without answering all of those specific? And Steve's been doing a great job um, yeah. with those coming through. But well, again, we... again, if you look at that list, it'll give you some general specifics for, you know, ta like I mentioned, shade. You know, to me, if you're going to go shade, it's taxes to use. It's Suga, the hemlocks. You know, those are going to be the two places to start, depending on how much light you get in there. If I've got a little more towards the shade, the dark shade, those are going to be my two best choices. Other stuff is going to be the opposite, where I've got full sun. But if you spend, you know, the, the, that's why I love the Isley website, because I think it gives every little piece of vital information. And honestly, ours is the same way. Nicole's put in an incredible amount of the conifers that we carry on there. 
you know, start with ours, go to a place like Isley, you hit that genus, you pop up and you can scroll through and look at, you know, dozens of options with different colors and growth habits of all these different ones we've talked about today. Can we also bring that kind of information in and talk to, oh, you know, yeah. like, I mean, we can't talk about other nurseries necessarily and what they do, yeah. but here in our nursery, you know, to say, these are my conditions. Can you help yep. me find the right thing? And exactly. Yeah. You know, and some, you know, sometimes we always kind of half smile and say, hey, you're looking for the wonder shrub. In this case, it would be the wonder conifer. That mythical creature doesn't exist, but we'll find something that'll fit your bill. I mean, even if it's something we may not have, we can look at perhaps trying to bring it in for you. You know, it's like, oh, you know what? I think this might work for you. I didn't get any this year, but let me see if I can find one. Because <clears throat> it's always better to me face to face. I mean, I'm making an investment in my yard when I'm buying a specimen like a conifer in particular. I do, I want this thing to last in your yard, not for two years or five years and 10 even. I want it there forever. Right? You shouldn't have to be replacing this stuff all the time. And if we get the right plant in the right spot with the right growth rate and the habit that you're looking for, you're going to be happy with it and not have to do a lot of work. If I go buy this and don't ask anybody and I put it in there and it's one that grows huge, you're going to lose. I mean, you know, planting a little Western red cedar every day up here. You put the Western red cedar two feet from the front steps and then three years later, like, well, what am I supposed to do? Cut it out and get it out of there and get something that doesn't get as big. You know, it's just too big of a plant for that spot because there's a lot of things we can prune and we can prune conifers as well. But if you go back to the beginning and we look at world conifers and random conifers, I have to keep up on the pruning. You know, Christmas tree growers, you know, shear their trees a little bit, yes. But I can't let it grow eight feet wide and go, okay, wait a minute. I want you back to four feet wide like you were before. You're done. You know, I can't cut to bare wood. I get no growth ever again. I don't want to top it. You know, all that stuff comes into play with conifers. Get the right size to start with and you won't have much maintenance long term. I hardly ever touch any of mine. Love that. We, you know, I like things that kind of work for me instead they of care themselves. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So, and you know, it is daunting, but it's good to know that there's, you know, experts like you. Especially, we've got a really great staff here that can yep. help. I mean, you know, me personally, point me in the right direction and say this is, yep. you know, make it less intimidating. So there you go. So we've got a question about wind, really like high winds, um, yep. and they've lost a conifer in the past. What species hold up well to really yep. windy conditions? You'll see that noted on a few cultivars of, of mainly variegated stuff on a few things, but I'll tell you two things you want to stay away from. If you've got cold, desiccating winds, especially in the wintertime coming out of the north, you don't want suppressus, the cypresses of any kind, That'll do your Wilma Goldcrest, the Monterey Cypress, Italians, all that stuff. You're going to get some wind burn. And the big one to me is Cryptomeria. Be real careful where you cite your Japanese cedar selection, whether it's big or it's a miniature. That one, again, tends to get maybe a little bit of wind burn if we get that cold, desiccating wind in the winter. If You know, pine, spruce, most of the majority of the stuff, never going to have an issue with. But those two in particular, I'd probably keep an eye on. Good to know. So there's kind of a specific question, but I'm going to put it in kind of general terms that makes sense to all of us. So um, if you, somebody said they lost a black pine due to snow, but you know, that could happen for a lot of us for a lot of different reasons where you kind of start to lose your plant um, and you do your best, you know, this person said they staked and, you know, are trying to help it. Um, how long do you kind of let it try and do its thing? Or how do you know if it's going to come back or if it's going to, you know, how do you know? Well, with, you know, again, this is probably an easier question with the conifer topic in particular, because I can tell you right now, if it turned brown and you don't have the color you had on the tip growth, it's probably done. And the last step would be hang on here for four weeks or so. You don't see new growth coming out in the pine in particular. You're going to see the candles emerge new needles. Yes, it's going to be a little sparse. Yes, I don't have any growth left um, except for the new growth, but it will kind of you know, get some structure back to it as time goes on. But if you are looking at something that is brown, brown, brown right now, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. It's probably not going to come back. I mean, you wait till this spring, see what happens and move on. You know, I'll use me again in my yard as an example. I always do. You know, I have two big Monterey cypresses. I mentioned either side of my patio. I have an old variety called Donard's Gold. 
I wanted something up eight, nine feet that I can shear. I love the blue, the yellow color looking out my window. I love sitting out there with the yellow and all the other plants around the garden. Um, but yes, we get a cold winter like this winter. I should, I should, I should, I'll take a picture of one of these years and put it in the slideshow. Yes, it has a little brownie frosting on it. It's not dead. It's not looking really well either. But I can tell you right now, it's happened before in 20 years. I'll walk out there with my head shears in a few more weeks when it warms up. I'll lightly clip it. I'll get a beautiful flush of that yellow again, and I'll be right back in business uh, for the next season. So, you know, don't give up on it yet. I mean, if I look, the pine's an easy one because I can tell you if it's brown, the needles are brown all the way to the tip, and you don't have a candle, maybe the candle's still on there, see what happens in spring and move on. But most of that stuff, if it, if it goes brown, something happened and it may not be the wind. It's probably not the cold. Perhaps it got wind burn. I would always guess with conifer myself, something's going on in the soil. Either you buried mulch up too far on the trunk, we cause root rot, or we've gotten growing down with the root system to the point where we've laid out on a hard pan clay layer, water table comes up in the wintertime, and then I got issues with some of that dry loving things. Gotcha. Good to know. Um, so some of us, you know, buy houses and we inherit things that are in the garden. Um, somebody <laughs> had, yeah, right. <laughs> somebody inherited a, a Hinoki who's been, uh, it seems like perhaps severely shaped. Um, what are your thoughts? You know, do they try and keep that shape? Do they let it grow out naturally? Is it a preference in terms of visual? You know, what do you this, do? This question intrigued me. If, if, if this person was here, I'd say, what kind of shape are we talking about? I'm not sure what they mean. Is I think it been it's like, like a cloud. Cloud like pruning? A, okay, yeah. okay. So if we stop pruning the clouds, yes. I had one in my yard, honestly, that was the same way when I moved in. And now it took a while, but now it's kind of grown together and it looks like a normal plant if you're not into the, the pom-pom thing. So um, let it go for a while. Um, yes, it's going to take a little bit of time. I don't know how open it is or how big it is without looking at it. You could send a picture. Um, if you like to the email and I'll take a look at it today, but um, it, yes, you can recover them. Uh, probably that, yes, if she would have said somebody spiral cut it into some topiary, yeah, you're going to have a, a tough time getting that back into a full pyramidal shape. How's that? <laughs> All right, valid. Good to know. <laughs> Um, okay, last question. So, you know, we talk about this pretty much with all topics is that, you know, not, uh, not all of us have a lot of space. So yep. you, you've talked about a lot of great options that kind of stay smaller in the conifer world. But what about containers? Can we grow yep. them in containers? How do we go about that? How do we know yep. when it's when they're done being in a container yep. and they need to move yep. out? You know, again, I, I can grow any plant in a pot period, no matter what topic we're talking about. They come in pots, you grow them in pots for a while. The decision is going to be how long do you want it to last in the pot, which is going to dictate how large a pot, you know, on and on and on. So I would really look carefully choosing the right variety. I want slow growth rate and probably something dwarf or miniature. If I go buy a Western Red Cedar because I love the look and the fragrance because I do too, and I put it in a two-foot pot off my patio, oh, it looks great. You know, in a couple of years, that thing is going to be root-bound and out of gas because it grows a lot faster. If I go buy the miniature western red cedar i've probably quadrupled my lifespan in the same container so maybe that helps a little bit the soil part of it you know is it the end of the world if i get potting soil you know maybe not but most potting soils are, are bred to be neutral more for flowers vegetables on and on uh, do not get anything with moisture control in it no miracle grow crop for this it's going to hold too much moisture you're going to cause the same problem in the container you know, if you're going to buy the best thing out there, get an acidic potting soil blend. Like we have EB Stone made for rhododendrons, azaleas, blueberries, and conifers. If I'm planting my cool little Japanese pine, because I've got a couple in pots in my backyard, I use that as my potting mix. Now I know I've got some acidity in there. I can just put a little compost on it every season, put a little food on it that's in the pot for sure, at least once a year, and on we go for another season. 
Love that. I love when, you know, you can walk in and it's part of why I love Sunnyside. I mean, partially because I work here and I'm a fan, but, um, <laughs> you know, that I can walk in and you guys will set me up. Like, this is what, you know, this is the type of plant for what you need. This is the soil. And it's not like a used car salesman. It's just like, here's what you need for success because nobody wants to take a plant home and expect it to die. I mean, we all want things to grow, right? So oh, I, if, I would say the same thing. I mean, that's what we're, you know, trying to teach our staff. We're going to have a little more sales training this year because yeah, it's great as a business to make money. I mean, that's why businesses are in. We're not trying to gouge anybody. We're not trying to get rich. We all love gardening. We'll charge a fair price and try to give you knowledge because ultimately, if you're successful, you're going to come back and watch another class, talk to Nicole, talk to me, talk to our staff because it's like, you know what? I got great advice there. I got the right plan for the right place. I'm going to keep going there. And that's what to me what it's all about. We want you to be successful in the garden. Yeah. And it's exciting when you successfully grow something, especially, you know, conifers that can stay in your yard for 20 years. It's, it's exciting. I think you converted me. I think I'm going to yeah. go get a conifer. Hey. Hey. And, then be like, and you'd be like me and you <laughs> walk around and go, I remember when I put you there about 15 right. years ago. I still love you. Yeah, there you go. I love it. There you go. Oh, well, thanks for joining us today. There's so much information. As always, you know, use this as a resource. Go back, pause. Um, he went through all those conifers pretty quick, but there's a lot of good information on those slides. Um, so you can go back and pause it and kind of get all the information. Utilize our website or Isley's, uh, isleynursery.com. Um, super great resources for information. And hopefully we get to see you around the nursery. The weather's changing. It's fun to get out and just walk around the plants. And, you know, it's a nice, relaxing, happy place. Um, and hopefully, you know, have some conversations, see what suits you and your yard best. Um, we'd love to chat with you about it. So like Trevor mentioned, tomorrow, new for 22 super exciting i can't wait to see what's on that list and uh yeah hopefully you join us tomorrow and or the next class for um veggies that's right saturday that's right thanks everyone we'll see you later yeah thanks everyone for joining us we'll see you again tomorrow hopefully mm -hmm.